Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, TCJA at 5, Federal Edition. We're approaching the fifth anniversary of the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So we've been talking about guilty, fitty, and the salt cap for half a decade. To mark the occasion, we're spending three episodes taking a closer look at how the TCJA has affected taxes on the state, federal, and international levels. This week's episode, the second in our series, takes a look at the TCJA's relationship with federal taxes. Tax Notes legal reporter Nathan Richmond will talk more about that in a minute. Later in the episode, we'll hear from Tax Notes international columnist Michelle Markham on her new column, Markham on Managing Matters. But first, Nate, welcome back to the podcast. Always a pleasure. Could you give us a brief, and I understand that's going to be difficult, a brief overview of the effect that TCJA had on federal taxes? As you pointed out, there is no brief summary of what the TCJA did to federal taxes. There's everything from the corporate rate cut to the new pass-through deduction, bonus depreciation changes, and interest deduction changes. It's rightly been called the biggest change to the tax code since the 1986 recodification. Now, I understand you recently spoke with someone. Could you tell us about your guest? Sure. I spoke with Jennifer Acuna from KPMG. While now in private practice, she was one of the congressional staffers working on the TCJA in 2017. All right. Let's go to that interview. Hi, Jen. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. So we keep hearing that the TCJA was the largest, most comprehensive piece of tax legislation since 1986. Can you give us a broad overview of the breadth and sort of changes that it made? Sure. No, happy to. And, you know, it was. And what made the TCJA different than a lot of the big tax bills that we see nowadays even including the most recent, you know, rather large tax bill, Inflation Reduction Act that we just saw a few months ago, is that it was tax for the sake of tax. It was not usually tax is the tail that wags the dog in these bills. You know, people say, oh, let's not forget about tax. And they tack on a tax title to a bill. This was a tax only bill. So there was the desire to, you know, change the corporate rate. So it moved from 35% to 21%, an overhaul of the international tax system. For a long time, you know, members had been hearing, you know, again and again had been concerned about, you know, the capital lockout effect of our previous system and the, you know, just the rate of inversions leading up to the TCJA. So that was on the international side. Those were big changes. But, you know, there's, I always like to say there's a little something sweet and some, you know, pain for everyone in the TCJA, because even though it had a $1.5 trillion deficit over the 10 years, there, I mean, there were there was a lot of spending in that bill, but also a lot of razors in that bill as well. So we saw 199 cap A, that's that pass-through deduction. That cost a significant amount of revenue. And that was paid for with some of that pain that I was talking about, like 163J, for instance, the you know interest limitation. And there were just a laundry list of individual provisions as well. We had rate cuts on the individual rates. There was some AMT relief provided in the bill. But like I said before, there's some good and, you know, there were some razors also. There was that salt limitation that really impacted, you know, a significant number of folks in high salt states, that $10,000 cap on the state and local tax deduction. And it was just a wide sweeping bill. Like I said, it had $1.5 trillion in net deficit. But really, I mean, it raised a lot of money in the contours of the bill. And also there was a lot of tax expenditures within the contours of that bill as well. Things like a great big new bonus depreciation, right? Yep. There was expensing, which is, you know, one of the topics of the day, because that is the first scheduled, you know, crank down of the 100% expensing is scheduled to come at the end of this year. So that goes from 100% expensing to 80% at the end of this year. So now it's an extender. And the TCGA created a ton of extenders too. So it's the tax bill that keeps on giving with respect to tax changes. Speaking of giving, 
it's been about five years and Treasury and the IRS seem to have a lot of guidance to give on uh, the TCJA from notices all the way up through proposed regs and final regs with, of course, the smattering of uh, procedures and revenue rulings throughout. We even had some of these uh, final regs coming out as Chief Counsel Mike Desmond was getting ready to leave at the end of the administration. So there have been these thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of final regs, and we're done, right? There's just the standard upkeep left. Everything major from the TCJA has had its clarification for people to be able to apply it, right? Are you uh, are you insinuating that Treasury has done a 100% perfect job and anticipated every problem that could potentially come into the future with their No, rights? just that every main issue has been dealt with. <laughs> yeah. No, I I I wish, but you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but Treasury's work is never done. I mean, I remember back during the TCJA in 2017, there were reg projects that were in progress that related back to the 86 Act. So unfortunately, Treasury is not ready to close the book, at least not yet. And that's, you know, that's the thing about Treasury. It's a lot easier for Treasury to be more nimble, issue, you know, regulatory guidance, issue other taxpayer guidance than it is for Congress to change laws. And that's like kind of one of the takeaways of the TCJA. It took 30 years to change that, but reg projects, they come and go on a regular basis. So sad, but true. I'm sure that we still have thousands of pages and new regs ahead of us in the future. Speaking of which, there's the long delayed and who knows what will happen now change from expensing to amortization for research and experimentation expenditures, right? Yes. And, you know, in terms of on the legislative front and on the regulatory front. So 174, the amortization of R&E. That was a razor, one of those, you know, the, one of the, some of the pain that was inflicted in the TCJA that kicked in at the beginning of this year and has been expired. It's considered an expiring tax provision, right? Because it kicked in. So it's kind of a reverse expiration. And that's something that, you know, we've been waiting to see if Congress would act to potentially, you know, reverse it kicking in at the beginning of this year. So you know, right now, almost a full year since it kicked in at the beginning of this year, and uh, still under discussion for the potential inclusion in a year-end package. One of those tax tales. Yeah, that's right. That is another instance of a, you know, tax tale that wags a dog. Everyone has their eyes on a potential extenders package in this big end-of-the-year package. Let's see if it gets negotiated. All the while, we still don't have a clarification of what's a research expenditure and what's a simple business expenditure, right? Yep. Still waiting to get that guidance. Like we said, Treasury is never done. So everybody knew when it was supposed to take effect. And IRS, Treasury, and Congress all seem to have been waiting, waiting, waiting to this point. You know, it's funny. It's one of those provisions that there was just a lot of bipartisan support to include relief on 174. I mean, this is something that, remember last year, 174 relief was included in the Build Back Better Act and that Democratic Reconciliation Bill, it passed the House. So, you know, when that bill had momentum, everyone said, hey, this is not going to kick in. It's not going to kick in at the beginning of next year. No worries. And then that got pushed into January and they said, oh, no, we're going to come back and do the Build Back Better Act in January. Remember, Senator Schumer said, we're going to put a pause So it's kind of been in this weird limbo for the last year. But I mean, most folks on the Hill, you know, Republicans, Democrats support providing 174 relief. So it's the non-controversial provision that can't seem to make it over the finish line, at least not yet. And given that Treasury and the IRS seem to have been somebody's coming to our rescue, right? That's always preferable. (laughs) Well, you mentioned bonus is getting ready to wind down. And here's 174. That's two extenders. What other TCJA extenders could be coming? Well, another one that also expired, and I call them the, you know, these are all 
the TCJA extenders that kind of hang together because they all expired mm-hmm. at the end of last year, 163J, it moves from an EBITDA to an EBIT standard that is taxpayer unfavorable that also kicked in at the beginning of this year. So that's another extender that's in the mix. And one that is not a TCJA extender, just throwing it out there because we're talking about the year-end deal, is the child tax credit. The expanded child tax credit was included in ARPA. And that also is part of the gang of extenders that expired at the end of last year. Kicked the, So that's another one where you have the child tax credit, those expanded benefits also expired when 174 kicked in, when 163J was modified. And now this year we have bonus that starts ratcheting down. So there's a lot. And it's not a, not a large number of extenders in terms of just the volume, like the number of extenders, but just those handful of extenders, they really pack a revenue punch. I mean, that there's a lot of dollars associated with that package of extenders, especially the child tax credit. So my hopes that we were done with extenders when the PATH Act passed were really naive. <laughs> I think we were all, you know, ha- I was on the Hill at Ways and Means when the PATH Act was negotiated and everyone high five that, you know, this is great. We're, we're clearing out all of these extenders. And sure enough, new bill, new extenders aplenty. Now, one other uh, blast from the past. Do these extenders, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's also a whole bunch of just straight expirations on the individual side. Do all of these things coming up resurrect the fiscal cliff discussions that were uh, from the uh, 2001 and 2003 tax cuts? Oh, I, you know, a lot of those extenders, I mean, the, all those individual extenders that we're talking about, that's 2025. I mean, that's so far down the road. I was joking with someone yesterday that 2025 may as well be 3025 in the legislative world because there are just so many issues that, I mean, we're dealing with extenders now that expired last year. Even though they have an eye on the extenders that are coming up in 2025, I don't think it's something that, you know, is top of mind or has much time pressure associated with it. Support for this podcast is provided by SafeSend. The lack of qualified candidates continues to cause issues in the profession, but progressive firms are empowering admin with tax automation software to do the heavy lifting. The SafeSend suite will save your admin staff hours on assembly, delivery, and e-signing of tax packages, saving money, and making staff happier. And your staff deserve the sweet life this coming busy season. Schedule a demo to experience this workflow automation solution for yourself at safesend.com. That's safesend.com. Okay, I got one more complication for you. You mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act earlier. Do any of these expirations or extenders interact with anything from that, particularly that very interesting corporate alternative minimum tax based on uh, book revenue? Well, you know, that's a fascinating question. And thank you for the complication. No, just kidding. (laughs) I love complications. We're tax people. Of course we love complications. So it's unclear. I mean, they do interact, right? 163J. That's a revenue raiser. But you know now this corporate AMT, which I think everyone is calling the CAMPTI now, so it has its very own fun way to deduce the corporate alternative minimum tax. Now we call it the CAMPTI. It's unclear how that is going to interact with the CAMPTI. You know, some of these provisions like bonus, you know, trickling, you know, starting to ratchet down, how that's going to interact with the CAMPTI. I think everyone is really focused on you know, seeing the first tranche of CAMPTI guidance to see how, you know, Treasury is going to hash that out. So with the recent visit between Biden and Macron, beyond all sorts of other discussions, we're hearing so much about how the uh, Inflation Reduction Act is interacting with international rules like Pillar 2 and the corporate AMT or various subsidies. But Didn't the TCJA have any interactions with prior base erosion projects from the OECD? 
Yes, you know, that is, thank you for bringing that up because that is something that I always remind folks of. You know, we talk about BEPS 2.0. Before BEPS 2.0, there was BEPS 1.0, which was just then known as BEPS, the Base Erosion Profit Shifting OECD project. And, you know, BEPS did not drive the international tax changes that took place in the TCJ, but I can say that you know, the TCJ changes like the guilty, the global intangible low tax income tax, you know, the beat, these things really did drive. It's kind of a blueprint. At least it was a starting point for the discussions on BEPS 2.0, right? So the U.S. really kind of took that first step towards what's now known as, you know, pillar two. So I, I always find that interesting. You know, we always talk about, you know, the U.S. hasn't signed on yet. The U.S. really did, you know, with the TCJ, lead the BEPS 2.0 effort before there was a BEPS 2.0. Is this sort of like FATCA proceeding country by country? I think that's exactly it. So you mentioned blueprint. Is that to say that the blueprint that preceded the TCJA drafts with the border adjustment tax was not drawn from? I can't remember how many pillars were in the first BEPS project. Now, you know, it's funny. See, you remember the border adjusted tax. Remember that little policy that was so important to House Republicans until it was not in the negotiations for the TCJA? Yeah, you know, the border adjusted tax, I think that was, I would like to say ahead of its time, but I just think that was just not the right time for a border adjusted tax. It was just a step too far for members of Congress to kind of wrap their heads around this type of complete overhaul of the way the U.S. taxes international profits. And it couldn't have helped that the Koch groups were trying to claim it was unconstitutional, I'm sure. Constitutionality does matter so, oh, yeah. in tax. So, you know, unclear. I mean, that was never fully hashed out. But I think, I mean, it had a more basic issue that, you know, there were just a lot of questions. It, it wasn't like you know, territoriality, for instance, is an international framework that has been road tested before. You know, our, our trading partners have territorial tax systems. So it's not like a bridge too far. Border adjusted taxes, you know, as the, you know, international corporate method of taxation was just something that had never been road tested truly in that form. And that was just too much to overtake. You know, Congress likes incremental changes, especially in tax. And this was just, there were just too many question marks to make it politically feasible. Speaking of one other incremental change from the TCJA, there's the domestic production deduction of 199, translated quite conveniently and eliminated as a revenue raiser at the same time into the pass-through deduction of 199 cap A. That's right. That was that trade-off. And, you know, the desire was to provide, you know, a, a broader benefit and also you know, there was there was a missing piece in the pass-throughs area in the in the TCJ. Remember, I, I mentioned earlier, there's they tried to make for there to be something for everyone. And there was that missing mm -hmm. chunk in the pass-through space, which, you know, is a huge swath of the business community in the United States. You know, they're organized as pass-throughs. So yep, that was the that was the trade-off. And they now share the same code section. Well, thanks again for joining us. It's been fascinating. Thank you for having me. And now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief Paige Jones. Paige, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Philip DeSalvo and Corey Dalton examine the core principles of Section 704C, and how the ceiling rule may result in unanticipated consequences for taxpayers. Elizabeth Blickley criticizes proposed regulations meant to implement the Taxpayer First Act. In Tax Note State, Tram Lee examines sales and use tax issues in the construction industry. Nikki Dobay and Catalina Barron outline the project to develop a multi-state power of attorney form. In Tax Notes International, Lucas de Lima Carvalho and Victor Guilherme Ateche explain what it means for AI to be sentient and break down the technicalities of taxing them. 
Isaiah Hunter explains how the Inflation Reduction Act's new excise tax could discourage companies from reverting to the United States. In featured analysis, Bob Goulder considers the recent Court of Justice of the European Union state aid decision in fiat and the implication for the European Commission's appeal in Apple. On the opinions page, Marie Sapiri breaks down the IRS and Treasury guidance on how indirect book accounting factors should be considered when calculating the Inflation Reduction Act's Section 45V credit. Bob Goulder and Joe Thorndike consider the historical context of why the IRS Criminal Investigation Division carries guns, all in five minutes. And now, for a closer look at what's new and noteworthy in our magazines, here is Tax Notes Executive Editor for Commentary, Jasper Smith. Thank you, Paige. I'm here with Michelle Markham, a professor at Bond University in Australia. Michelle, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Jasper. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you're most welcome. So we're here to discuss your article, Advancing Tax Certainty, the new OECD Bilateral APA Manual, which is the first in your new Tax Notes International column, Markham on Managing Disputes. So Michelle, can you start by giving us a brief overview of this article? Yes, of course. So my first article deals, as you've said, with the OECD's new Bilateral Advanced Pricing Arrangement Manual. and this is part of the tax certainty work program of the Forum on Tax Administration. It's a really important document as bilateral APAs are the only process by which international transfer pricing issues, especially the potential for double taxation, can be addressed with certainty on a prospective basis. Bilateral APA is all about dispute prevention and they're an invaluable controversy management tool in the global tax arena. And interest in them worldwide is growing. Bilateral APAs have many advantages, but one of their main disadvantages is that they take too long to conclude. And this seems to be a problem on a global basis. There's a growing criticism that the use of the term advance is something of a misnomer. Some agreements have taken 10 years to conclude. What this manual attempts to do is offer guidance in the form of 29 best practices that should assist in streamlining bilateral APAs. I examine and evaluate some of the main best practices in this article. And in doing this, I refer to current national bilateral APA practices. I hope your readers will find this discussion interesting and of value. Well, thanks, Michelle. You definitely did a nice job of explaining and articulating the importance of the topic. Was there anything in particular that prompted you to write about it this time? Essentially, it's just a brand new publication by the OECD. Understandable, understandable. Thanks. I hope our readers look forward to it or will enjoy it as well. I'm sure they will. So, Michelle, can you talk a little bit about where the idea for your column came from? Yes, thank you. The prevention and resolution of international tax treaty disputes has long been an important issue for both taxpayers and tax administrations. The OECD has been talking about improving tax treaty dispute mechanisms for at least the last 40 years. But I've noticed how this issue has moved to the forefront in recent years. The OECD began publishing annual statistics on the Mutual Agreement Procedure, or MAP, caseloads in 2006. Today, these statistics cover over 100 jurisdictions. The MAP is the mechanism contained in the OECD's Model Tax Convention, at Article 25, and in the United Nations Model Double Tax Convention, also at Article 25, to provide a resolution by the respective tax treaty authorities of any disputes that may arise where a taxpayer considers that taxation contrary to the terms of the treaty has occurred. Now, in practice, contrary to the terms of the treaty, usually refers to a situation where the taxpayer 
is potentially subject to double taxation, which is an inequitable situation. A significant problem is that a number of these international taxation disputes remain unresolved. And that's to the detriment of the free flow of trade and investment and to all stakeholders. The problem is exacerbated by the fact that it's often the multi-million or billion dollar cases that remain unresolved. Currently, even though strenuous efforts have been made to resolve these international tax treaty disputes, the number of transfer pricing disputes is increasing on an annual basis, as are the map inventories in a majority of jurisdictions. This is therefore a critical time to focus on the application of various procedures to prevent and resolve these tax treaty disputes. In other words, to effectively manage these tax disputes and to provide a column on this topic. So can you give us an idea of other topics we might see in your column in the future? Well, the OECD has said they're going to be publishing another manual, hopefully sometime early in the new year, and that's on multilateral maps and APAs. And I think this would be another very interesting topic. Very nice. Very well put, Michelle. And before we let you go, can you just tell our listeners where they can find you online? Jasper, I'd be delighted to connect your audience on LinkedIn. And I can also be contacted at my email address at Bond University. And that's at mmarkham at bond.edu.au. Well, once again, thanks, Michelle. We appreciate you adjusting your schedule. We know you're on a different side of the world from us. We thank you for making the time to come on the podcast today. Thank you very much for inviting me. And you can find Michelle's column online at taxnotes.com. And as always, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tax Notes, for more in-depth discussions on what's new and noteworthy. Again, that's Tax Notes with an S. Back to you, Dave. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at Tax Stew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want to see more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, as well as showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish.